Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Wednesday, December 21st, 2022, the winter solstice. Good to have you on board, everyone. It's a quiet day here in Annapolis. All the midshipmen have gone home for a winter break, so kind of nice to be around here. And the bad weather hasn't hit uh, the storm that's running across the country. It's a nice, beautiful, sunny day here. Uh, and today on the show, we've got two guests who are cyber warfare experts, Navy cyber warfare experts. It should be a great conversation. Uh, first, a word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Blue Cross Blue Shield Vision Coverage. What makes good vision coverage? Things like fully covered vision care exams for all members, access to over 125,000 independent providers and national retailers. That's why you should choose Blue Cross Blue Shield FEP Vision. Plans start as low as $12 a month. See what we can do for you at bcbsfepvision.com. All right, let's roll into the show. My guests today are Commander Jake Beber, U.S. Navy, and Lieutenant Commander Tyson Medors, U.S. Navy. They are both recent contributors to the American Sea Power Project. Commander Beber's article is titled, Cyber Power is a Key Element of Sea Power. It appears in the December issue of Proceedings. And Lieutenant Commander Metter's article, Cyber Warfare is a Navy Mission, is in the September issue. And as I mentioned, both are part of the American Sea Power Project. Jake Tyson, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. All right. So, uh, you know, we've got a lot of people in our audience who listen because they love, you know, Navy ships, uh, Marine Corps stuff, Coast Guard things, uh, and, and the whole you know, cyber is still a little bit new to a lot of uh, a lot of folks, including me. Uh, so I, I said that you're both cyber warfare experts. So just take 30 seconds to describe your current jobs, your cyber experience, your career path. What made you uh, cyber warfare uh, officers in the, in the U.S. Navy? Start with Jake. OK, um, so, yeah, my current job, I am the cyber operations branch head at uh, SOCOM. So our, our job is actually more of what I would call the man train and equip side. But uh, my career has, as a cryptologic warfare officer has kind of uh, jumped back and forth between traditional afloat cryptology, uh, the normal SIGINT mission that most in the Navy are familiar with, as well as uh, spending time at, in cyber. Um, I am not a cyber expert in the sense that like Tyson is, Tyson's like the 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 really big brain when it comes to this, I'm what you would call more of on the planning side uh, where, where we do a lot of uh, uh, thinking about how we would want to employ cyber power in order to achieve our strategic effects, especially in the maritime domain. So that's kind of where my position is on this. Got it. So you're at U.S. Uh, Special Operations Command, so calling in from Tampa, Florida. Calling in from Tampa, uh, my previous duty station, I was the XO up at Information Warfare Training Command in Corey Station, where we train all of our CTNs and ITs who perform largely the network uh, administration and cyber operations for the entire U.S. Navy. So I got to see a big uh, exposed to and, and deal with a lot of the training side of how we grow and create cyber warriors in the Navy and the Joint Force. Um, and it's it's long, it's complex. It, it is not something that uh, you can just turn on a dime. Uh, so it, it requires a lot of strategic forethought on the part of our senior leaders to think about uh, what kind of cyber sailor do I need in five years and 10 years and 15 years? Because um, that, that takes a lot of time and experience. It's not something you can quickly master uh, in just a tour even. Yeah, great point, great point. Uh, so Tyson, tell us a little bit about yourself. No pressure, uh, cyber quote unquote expert. I, I am a Navy cyber warfare engineer, uh, and we're the only designator in the Navy right now who gets to be pure cyber. Um, I became a cyber warfare engineer in 2019 when it opened up for lateral transfers from other officer communities. I started my career out as a service warfare officer, did one tour, went over to intelligence about 10 years ago now. Um, all my intel jobs or all my jobs were are, have been cyber jobs. Uh, and that included quite a few years here at Fort Meade, where I still where I am today, uh, and one tour at the White House, um, uh, where I did cyber policy, which was sort of 
off field for me by that point. Uh, cyber warfare engineers, most of us are cyber capability developers, which means some sort of flavor of software engineer, network engineer, vulnerability analyst, uh, reverse engineer type, type thing where we build software to do cyber things. Um, some of us also are more and more engaged in operations, uh, trying to find places where we build the airplane and fly it uh, because we build it. So we know where the controls are, that sort of thing. Um, and more and more uh, kind of been leading larger teams uh, of varying sizes all the way up to 250 folks, uh, usually closer to about a dozen. Um, building cyber capabilities, operating cyber capabilities out in the field, uh, doing a lot of experimentation in R&D. And, and these things really flow pretty tightly uh, when you kind of get out to the edge where, you know, you build something, you test it, and then you use it in a very tight time frame. And that's what cyber warfare engineers do. We try to create advantage by being fast, sort of um, what an industry would call DevOps, development operations, where there's this constant cycle. Uh, and, and cyber warfare engineers can do that for cyber, we can do that for data science. We, we, we're just trying to kind of be the enablers of all the both the joint and Navy missions where that can create competition and competitive advantage. That's great. Uh, a little bit of the background here. I, I mentioned that, that both your essays are part of the American Sea Power Project. And as we were going through and switching from the ends to the ways aspect of the project, so it's ends, ways, means of strategy with working with Jerry Roncolato and Paul Giara, you know, there was this growing um, sort of sense that we had that that cyber needed to be a big part of this conversation. It couldn't all be about ships and hull counts and what kinds of ships and how many DDGs versus SSNs versus CVNs, you know, the Navy needed to have. But cyber was a, um, a, growing, a growing mission area in importance, a growing uh, capability mix, but also something that was very maybe um, under not well understood. Uh, not well appreciated, and how does it play into the ways of sea power in the 21st century? So, um, so a little bit of preamble there. But Tyson, your article starts by saying the Navy needs its own specialized cyber force to fulfill its traditional mission of protecting the nation's maritime-based economy. And Jake, yours is titled "Cyber Power is a Key Element of Sea Power." They're complementary articles. They come at this cyber issue from different directions. I'm going to ask each of you to just take a minute to describe the main problem or the main, you know, uh, I guess, gap that exists that you're trying to address. So, so Tyson, why don't you go first? Uh, thanks, Bill. Yeah. So basically what I looked at, first principles, you know, why does the United States of America have a Navy? And if you look at Federalist 11, look at Article 1, Section 8, you look at sort of the underpinnings of what the U.S. Navy is supposed to do for the people of the United States, the economy of the United States, it's it's to defend maritime commerce. That's 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 job one. Just make sure stuff can flow east, west, north, south, where it needs to go. Um, this, this has evolved over time. There are, there are obviously other important important missions, power projection, obviously. But but if you start with first principles, protecting maritime commerce, the maritime economic interests of the United States, then what follows is you have to kind of be able to do that against all threats. And what we've seen in the past 10 years, if not longer, is more and more cyber threats in this space. Um, and a lot of them kind of threatening trade in, in maritime trade, like pirates have uh, over, over centuries past, where they go after maritime commerce, they, they put at risk, you know, whether it's our ports or our waterways or international trade more broadly. Um, the U.S. is at such a disadvantage against that type of threat because we're sort of the nexus of so much global trade. Um, our Navy needs to be able to expand into that space. And that oftentimes means being able to do cyber missions at sea. It means being able to do cyber missions abroad. It means constant patrolling, uh, for what that means sort of in a cyber way, constantly being in the domain and operating to identify where the adversaries are, what they're trying to do, frustrating those adversaries, defeating those adversaries, and also retaining the ability to project power into the maritime cyberspace. So, you know, having the ability to to defend ships and attack ships is something that a navy has always been able to do. It's sort of the 
the, the mission, the reason for being. And so as cyber capabilities have become more relevant to this space, which is what happens when you put so many more computers and so much more automation into the maritime uh, infrastructure, ships and ports included, um, the navies of the world to include ours have to follow. And if you're going to be a preeminent, dominant Navy of the 21st century, you're going to have to have a naval cyber force that can project power, that can defend, that can operate in the maritime environment, commercial and, you know, uh, state sovereign, uh, in order to be successful. And so, you know, the, the core argument of my paper is, let's be that Navy, let's have that capability, and let's build that force. Got it. Thanks. Uh, I'll go to Jake next. Um, so what was the, the, the main sort of problem statement for, for your paper? Hey, th thanks. Appreciate it. Um, so cyber power is fundamentally has fundamentally changed the character of sea power. Um, we've kind of seen this historically with the internet when, when we've had the introduction of new technology or new sciences or new concepts. And when they touch an older domain, such as how the character of sea power, for example, was shaped by celestial navigation in the 16th century or air power in the 20th century. Um, our biggest problem, actually, uh, I argue, is the debilitating intellectual constraints on cyber power. They have prevented the United States, especially the U.S. Navy, from leveraging cyber power to grow sea power. Um, conversely, our principal adversary, China, they have successfully employed cyber-enabled means to shift the balance of global sea power decisively in their favor. Uh, that my article proposes a series of steps that the Navy might take to what I call navalize cyberspace operations to advance our sea power. These includes uh, addressing vulnerabilities not only in our own combatants, but uh, also our own merchant fleet, uh, our sea, uh, our, our sea lift capabilities, our ports, our entire maritime infrastructure. Uh, we have to align our talent acquisition uh, and development to create a separate maritime cyber force that along the lines of what Tyson is arguing for, which I strongly advocate for as well, um, to action those items that matter most to the Navy and not necessarily a combatant commander. And I know that um, they'll probably rip away my JPME qual for saying <laughs> that, but, you know, like things that matter to a geographic combatant commander, while important, are not always necessarily the number one priorities of the U.S. Navy. Um, fundamentally, cyber power can best support American sea power, first and foremost, we have to alter the trajectory of China's sea power. Uh, let me say that again. We must alter the trajectory of China's sea power. And that starts in cyberspace, actually. Time is not on our side. We are well within the envelope of strategic surprise. 2027 is coming fast. And if you've been paying attention to the words of Admiral Gilday, Admiral Aquilino, and others, um, you know, the, the winter is coming, as it were, and we are well behind the curve when it comes to that. So um, that's kind of the crux of my argument. Yeah, no, great points. Uh, great summary there. I'll go back to Tyson for a second. So um, you mentioned Federalist 11 a, a couple of minutes ago, and, and when we were reading your article, it reminded us so much of uh, Nick Lambert's piece for the American Sea Power Project, which we published in April 2021. And that that article was titled, What is a Navy for? Um, and, and Nick evoked much of Mahan's, especially Mahan's later work that focused on commerce and commerce protection, maritime trade. So can you just describe a little bit some of the threats to maritime trade, uh, to the global maritime system that are happening? And what's the Navy doing to address those threats now? Well, the, the, there's, there's a lot more to talk about in the first part of that question than the second part of the question. Um, so we're seeing, you know, growing degrees of sophistication of, let's just say, criminal activity. So usually when we talk about cyber, we talk sort of this, this spectrum of capability, usually, you know, 
troublemakers, pranksters kind of at the low end with nation states like China, uh, they're at the high end. So you have this spectrum. And here, kind of where criminals lay, sometimes criminals work for the nation states, sometimes criminals are just trying to cause problems. And if we just talk about criminal behavior, um, we've seen pirates in a couple of different cases, uh, Malaysia being one of them, you know, hack into ships uh, to understand the cargo that's on board and then make decisions about what they're going to physically pirate. Um, drug uh, smugglers have hacked into ports to hide or modify bills of lading or, 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 or cargo manifests to hide what's actually on a ship or where it came from. Um, just two days ago, in an article published by the Maritime Executive, um, you know, a researcher out of the University of Bath in the UK identified dark web chatter. So, you know, kind of the, the part of the internet where criminals and other nefarious groups to include nation states play. There was a lot of chatter uh, on forums uh, by criminals and others um, during the ever given uh, grounding from a few years ago about how to make that happen on purpose in order to manipulate commodity and other types of markets and make money on it that way. We've seen that type of criminal activity before uh, in other sectors where cyber attacks have been used to create um, market fluctuations that organized criminal groups can make money off of. And now we're seeing criminals openly talk about it or semi-openly talk about it on the internet about how to do this to ships, how to create ever given type conditions, uh, which aren't that hard to do relative to, to other types of criminal activity. Um, on ships, and, and and then you know by being able to predict that uh, when it occurs, make trades uh, and, and buy commodities and do other wow. sorts of things, and and that's you know that may sound a little sophisticated. It may also sound like the plot of Casino Royale, yes. uh, which was, was sort of the terrorism version of that, um, but it's done. Um, and more problematic, I think, from us is because there's no single entity in the U.S. or globally. Uh, to kind of track or investigate this sort of thing. If it were happening today, um, below a certain threshold, we probably wouldn't recognize it. And, and that's a problem, right? That's just fundamentally a problem. It's sort of people are getting good at sort of sophisticated cyber things against ships and we don't know about it. The other piece is, as we've seen in Ukraine more recently, when criminal groups are in a space doing activity, whether that's a geographic space or a sector of, 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 of the economy, that can very, very quickly turn into a nation state capability because of sort of the, the relationships of convenience between criminals and nation states. And so if we're in a world where there's criminals doing a lot of cyber operations against ships for, to make money, and then there's a geopolitical crisis or an ongoing geopolitical crisis, um, very quickly, you know, we could see the types of disruptive or manipulative actions that, that effectively, if it was in the kinetic space, it was in the physical space, it would be a Navy responsibility, or in some cases, a Coast Guard, but most navies in the world are more like our Coast Guard. It would be a naval responsibility to respond. And, you know, that's why we're here. That's that Federalist 11 starting point. Um, that's sort of a continuous strategic argument why we have a continuously capitalized and recapitalized Navy, you know, operating globally, right, since, since the uh, Great White Fleet, is to kind of make sure we have a the ability to protect our, our commercial and economic interests. And now that criminals and, and other nation states, Jake, Jake's pointing out the, 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 um, the pacing threat in China, and I think that's really important. Um, but now that we know that they're there, the Navy has to be there, and they have to be there the way that the US Navy has been there for a, at least 100 years, which is overwhelming force, the ability to have more capacity, more capability, um, than the adversaries that we face. And so the argument here, whether you use criminals or whether you use the high-end threat uh, that, that China represents, that, that's a lot of work that we need to do and we need to do really well. Um, and so this is sort of the, you know, yeah, what's we can do, we can just look at the headlines, we can just look at the industry chatter uh, on, the, on the maritime space and understand this is moving fast, wow. right? And this is only going to grow until, you know, there is a deterrent force of global capability in the space defending and, and constantly being able to kind of keep task or keep track of and you know mitigate these threats in sort of a defend forward fashion uh, to use um, nomenclature that Jake's been using in his work. Yeah, I'll, I'll remind our listeners that the Ever Given was that container ship, massive container ship that uh, kind of went sideways in the Suez Canal, but about two years ago. And uh, the impact to the global economy of that that incident was four 
hundred million dollars per hour. A, a fact that just blew me away. And I heard it repeated and I looked it up. Wall Street Journal, uh, the Marketplace podcast. I listened to a number of different of uh, uh, um you know, good economic analysis is analyses, uh, you know, confirmed that $400 million an hour. So, yeah, the, the idea that hackers would want to manipulate ships to do something like that intentionally, uh, that just gives you, a, a, you know, a, a little bit of a sense of what that impact could be on the global economy. Yeah, huge. Uh, so, Jake, back to you. So Tyson talked a bit about the you know, hackers and criminal groups and what they're up to. You talk a lot in your article about China and China's military capabilities in the cyberspace. Just give us a little bit of, uh, about that and where, how they're ahead of, in some places, the U.S. Navy in this warfare, you know, critical warfare area. Yeah, so um, the short answer is yes. Uh, think think about uh, Tyson's example of uh, ever 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 given and uh, imagine that instead of the criminal hackers, that is uh, Chinese cyber operators, and they park a, uh, a container ship right in the middle of the Panama Canal, and that's when oh, there's a crisis in around Taiwan, and you want to get all of everybody in Norfolk. Now you got to go all the way around. Um, uh, all the way around South America to try yeah, and adding, over. adding weeks, right? Adding weeks, you know, with tyranny of distance, right? So um, if criminals can do it, I can assure you that our good friends in, in China and elsewhere can do it as well. Um, so is, is China ahead? Short answer. Yeah, I argue they are. Um, and it, but, but I would argue it, it doesn't start with the exquisite and expensive cyber tools um, that the PLA or the Chinese intelligence services like MSS that they can field. It starts in their conceptual approach. And this is our biggest problem. It, guys like I, I'll put Tyson up against anybody anywhere in the world. I, I'm not concerned about our talent so much at, or our ability to develop the tools that we need. It's the conceptual approaches that that people are taking uh, in leadership. And consider this. Uh, the PRC is able to employ what I would call a unified approach to their creation of and projection of sea power, a unified approach. When we in the United States think about it in the DOD, we talk about cyber enabled capabilities or cyber operations being discrete events. The PRC leverages cyber among all of its national power tools at its disposal in order to achieve large-scale strategic effects. So, for example, its domination of maritime construction, all of those merchant vessels, container ships floating out, of, out, of, out off Long Beach, for example, most of them built in China and the rest are built in South Korea and, and maybe Japan. But they're not built in the United States anymore. Um, it's domination of maritime construction, uh, the port infrastructure, its control, leverage over, and operation of ports to include cranes. Right? We we think about how do you get a, how do you how do you exercise that uh, uh, international trade? Right? It's through that infrastructure that we have. Um, their domination of critical supply chains, their domination of social media. All of those things are intertwined and interconnected as a means to generate and project power. And conceptually, that's, that's light years ahead of where we are. Mm -hmm. uh, they use cyber exploitation to penetrate and pilfer not only our critical technology, you know, stealing plans for LCSs and ZoomWalts and F-35s, but they also do it to put their, com their competitors out of business, right? Um, so that gives them control over market share. They're able to leap ahead by generations simply by using cyber enabled means to steal research and development, not only from the United States, but from globally. Um, we actually partner with Chinese students and researchers at our universities and our industries. Yeah. We partner with them, and then we don't expect them to walk away and take that technology, which is all dual use, back to China. Um, 
In the DOD, we play a never-ending game of whack-a-mole when it comes to cybersecurity. Or worse yet, we continue to utilize um, what I would consider suspect and compromised network technology. And then we wonder why we continue to have uh, our information and intelligence continues to get stolen. Um, I I'm sorry, but there's no amount of cyber awareness training you can take so long as your router was built in China. <laughs> I, I, I'm just like, I'm just like, why am I, <laughs> it doesn't matter yeah, if I click yeah. on the phishing link, you know, I, and, I, and save Dave from, you know, the year 2030, that silly cyber awareness training we have to take. I, I'm reminded of, uh, you know, you, you, you brought up the, uh, the point about cranes, right. And, mm -hmm. and those cranes being built overseas, not being built by American, you know, and then the, the commercial interest that, that China has exerted in, in either buying or having long-term leases on foreign ports. So when an American Navy ship now pulls into a port in many places in the world, there yeah. are means for the Chinese to, to you know, observe, to, uh, you know, conduct espionage, electronic espionage on us because of the infrastructure that they've built in those ports. Well, it's not only yeah, it's not only uh, not only that, but you know, it's potentially sabotage or through financial leverage deny you entry. Um, we 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 don't it, it, remember because all of those ports and all of that infrastructure in that port, those are now digital, and they're giving and, and the Chinese um, the the Chinese are giving away when you sign the lease with them for them to run your port. They provide you the operating software. Oh, how convenient. It's now Chinese operating software we're using all over the world. Wow. Um, now well, I, think, I yeah. think the Navy's starting to get this. I don't want to be all gloom and doom. I mean, if you read um, their information superiority vision 2020, their cyber superiority vision of 2022, you, you can see that conceptually we're, we're starting to move in that direction. But, man, we are way behind the curve here. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of the conversation about cyber in the in the pages of proceedings and, and including a couple of uh, podcasts that we've had uh, going back a couple of years ago tended to be focused on, you know, the creation of the information warfare community, the stand up of the information warfare commander afloat concept. So on, on carrier strike groups, you've got the strike warfare commander, you've got the uh, the surface war, the, you know, SUW commander. Um, and, and now you've got the information warfare commander. So, um, Tyson, could you talk a little bit about how that information warfare commander concept is developing? Is it is it moving the Navy in the in the in the direction that we need to move to address the threats that both you and Jake have been talking about today? Probably not. Um, and there's a couple of reasons we have to consider for this. So, you know, you know, one of the ways I'll paraphrase what Jake just talked about is the technology in cyber, in cyber warfare, is the terrain, right? You have to have technological expertise, technology expertise, in order to understand how to maneuver. Now, Jake, you know, was just down there at Quarry Station, where I think officers get about one week in cyber, and they might get a couple more weeks, you know, across the course of a 20-year career. Um, that doesn't create technology expertise. In fact, even if you have technology expertise, if you're away from cyber for two or three years, it's probably aged off. Um, so there's sort of a career path limitation uh, that the IAWC sort of imposed on itself. And, I, and, and you know, uh, NDA that just got signed basically says, hey, Navy, you have to create an expert cadre in this domain, in cyber. You have to create a cyber officer designator. They might not be part of the IWC. Let's, let's talk about that yep. because, you know, ultimately we, we have, I mean, you can't walk away from this. Like if I, I've had 10 years in this space, 10 years just doing cyber. Um, when I went away and did policy for two years, I came back at a very severe, severe handicap. I've spent 40, 60,000 ish dollars of my own cash just to get retrained. So I feel confident in this domain the Navy's not providing that because right now that's not the construct we have uh, for continuing education that we would need to stay cyber relevant, right? Fingers crossed you get sent to a command that has training resources or a national entity that has training resources, but it's not Navy. That's a problem. And the other one um, that's pretty key here is with regards to the terrain, um, the technology that's on board a strike group, any of the ships, any of the aircraft, 
Um, when I think about the maneuver that I would want to do in cyberspace, I would be putting new code onto those systems. I would be modifying the code on those systems. I would be doing patching and other things on the fly. There's sort of a, you, you can't really do that afloat, right? In and of itself, right? The, the syscoms have to sign off on most of that. There's a PEO. We don't have the sort of um, governance regime that would allow sort of independent cyber operations at sea. And so, you know, I don't, this isn't really the IWC's fault, right? As a community or as an entity afloat, it's just, there's just, they're not allowed to do much cyber. I mean, it has a lot more to do with how we, you know, man, or how we, how we equip than how we organize and how we man and train. Um, and, and all of these things will have to get fixed, right? And for the, in order for the IWC to be sort of a um, service warfare commander type equivalent at sea where they're, they're doing MEO, they're doing, you know, uh, screens and all some of the other things that other warfare commanders do. I think right now the cyber really isn't in the quiver of most IWC commanders, at least not to the degree that, you know, a strike warfare capability would be sort of pushed forward at the strike group level. So there's a lot that would have to be done uh, to get there. And in order to make the information work commanders afloat, you know, really be, you know, tactical war fighting in cyber. Now they do other things in the EM domain, the electro, uh, electro, uh, electromagnetic maneuver warfare domain that is important and necessary uh, from a survivability perspective, but it's not cyber warfare uh, at a level that yeah, I think Jake suggests would be required to really go toe to toe with a, with a peer like the Chinese. Interesting. And, and uh, I'll, I'll sort of uh, bring in a, uh, an, an outsider or a layman's perspective because I'll, I'll point out that Tyson, you're a member of our editorial board, and we've had a lot of conversations around this topic around the boardroom uh, with, at, at editorial board meetings. And um, if I can paraphrase a little bit some of that, that discussion, um, you know, it, when, when, when an F-18 or a you know, carrier strike group uh, and a, a squadron of F-18s leaves they, on a deployment, they lock down essentially the capabilities of that, that jet, right? So the NATOPS isn't gonna change for six months. The, um, you know, the startup procedures, uh, the weapon systems, all that stuff isn't going to change. But for the IW warfare commander, as you pointed out, the technology changes so fast and the adversary changes so quickly that the, you know, the information warfare commander can't do the things to protect the systems on board that carrier strike group that w might be needed in a very agile uh, cyber warfare fight at sea. And if I if I bastardize that terribly, just just let me know. But that was that's kind of how I understand that it would it makes perfect sense because if you're going to make any changes to the software, the operating systems in the Aegis system or in the F-18 weapon system or the Growler weapon system, et cetera, you know that's got to be vetted by engineers. That's got to be vetted by the Syscoms. That's got to be tested at the uh, you know at VX4 and VX5 and those kinds of things, right? It's got to be vetted. But that's also takes that takes you know months to years to do. Well, it does right now, um, and this is sort of the key. And you know, if you want to kind of you know stick your finger in the air and say, "How are we doing?" You know, if it takes month to years, months to years to do that type of action, to do that type of testing, you know, can we replace Library A with Library B because Library A we just found out was compromised, you know, while it was in production five years ago? We got to change it out quickly. Yep. You know, if you if you can't do that within hours, if not faster, you might not be fast enough for 21st century naval warfare. And and the type of expertise you need at the edge or in the operational forces or the type of cooperation you need between, you know, what we've traditionally siloed off as systems commands and operational commands, that paradigm may need to shift considerably. The IWC commander probably is the the afloat point of contact to kind of to kind of be the the, the quarterback of that yep but they need to be trained to do that you need to have on their staff the type of engineering expertise that will help them evaluate and implement at the edge and there's a whole tale of that that goes all the way back to um back ashore but that's that's the agility that we need and it's not really a paradigm that's been kind of put out into the force and you know, my, my big concern is that practically speaking, you know, 
if we don't evolve towards that very, very quickly, you know, uh, there could be a lot of ships that have issues maneuvering yeah. through and around the Omaha Canal so, so because there's just so much one to of attack. Our, one of our listeners, Ryan McDonald, throws a question at the chat. Uh, can a warship like a destroyer be hacked? And and I want to I want to add to that. So the, the the book that came out about a year ago, 2034, by Admiral Stavridis, our former chair of our of our board of directors, starts off South China Sea, two destroyers, U.S. Navy destroyers operating around some Chinese ships, and and all of a sudden, it, what essentially happens is the Chinese like flick a switch, and all of the systems on board U.S. Navy destroyers go dead. Um, so I. I not not being one of you, Tyson, not being a cyber warfare engineer, I read that and went, I don't know, is that is that realistic? And and so that's kind of the point that, that Ryan's making. Is is that realistic? Is that is that possible? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I mean, it's been possible for well over, I don't know, about 20 years, maybe. I mean, wow. we when you bring computers that get networked to other computers, when there's connections back to shore, you, you create this, what we call attack surface. Um, and it doesn't matter if that attack surface is in a power substation in Ukraine or uh, a commercial ship or a port, it doesn't, it's there. Um, and what we've seen, and, and this is a really significant paradigm shift that I'm gonna foot stomp. Um, there was a significant paradigm shift in 2015 when we saw the Russians doing kinetic cyber physical operations in Ukraine to take down their power grid. Like, okay, they did an even better job and almost did really, really good in 2016, um, where they went after transmission, even more impressive. Right. Um, that's cyber physical. Right. And that's what would notionally keep a, a destroyer from moving or any other sort of things with machinery from moving. Right? That's, that's been demonstrated. The other key thing that I think we should really keep in mind, Jake points this out in his article. It's where most of, say, the cyber uh, readiness review that, uh, that the uh, SecNav did back in 2019 did. There's a supply chain issue here. Mm. Um, the solar winds event from about two years ago, you know, adversary cyber actor gets into the software supply chain of a vendor that has points of presence across the entire federal government to include DOD, to include Department of State, to include hundreds, actually tens of thousands of other companies. And they're going in there and they're manipulating the software before it gets pushed out to the world to allow them access later on. And this is really hard to detect, like really hard to detect. If they're in there, if they're in a software production environment, um, they can make changes and, and they're really hard. Like as a customer, it's almost impossible to catch it. Right. So if you think about how long, as Jake points out, the Chinese have been in our software supply chain. Every single time they're there, they have the option to do two things, steal, right, which they've yeah. done, and change. And those aren't mutually exclusive. They can do both. And to be able to go back retroactively and verify that nothing's been changed, that can be very, very hard. And so what you have is sort of this perfect storm. You have sort of the low pressure and the hot water, and you just start this. There is a real, real risk of, of things not working when you need them to. Um, wow. <laughs> I think I mentioned this in the editorial board meeting. I, I like to call it Schrodinger's fleet. You know, is it a fleet that is going to be operational available when you actually need it to be operationally available? Right? Readiness you know, we, we, have a, we have a readiness issue right on the edges here, but, but we think our fleet is operationally ready, generally speaking. But if you're in a situation where your supply chain has been compromised for a very long time by an adversary who has some idea of what they wanna do and when they wanna do it, that's a very dangerous place to be in. And so that's sort of the Schrodinger's fleet idea. Yeah. Um, you know, Schrodinger. yeah, destroyers, airplanes, I think yeah. airplane, I think it was an F-35 in the first book they did uh, that had a supply chain compromise that somehow let the missiles know to go right to it. Yeah, I mean, was, these are, these are, these are plausible things. Right. Um, and, and they're not, um, they're not perfect. Cyber weapons are never perfect. A lot of times they just don't work. Right. But if enough of them work, you have a real operational problem in front of you that quite frankly, um, I want to be on the giving end of that, not the receiving end of that. 
Amen. Okay, so we're getting uh, skosh on time here. So I'm going to give you each a, a minute or two to just sum up in, in from your articles. Uh, what are your recommendations? How do we how do we move the ball forward? How does the Navy get uh, closer to being uh, able to inflict its will rather than being having the enemy's will inflicted upon us? Uh, so start with Jake. All right. So uh, the first thing I would do is is leverage a lot of what what Tyson's talking about, the creation of what I call maritime cyber teams uh, to be able to resource and action what the Navy needs, um, not necessarily about the combatant commander. We, the Navy, have got to expand our scope. That includes uh, the maritime industrial base to include the ports, the undersea cable system, commercial shipping. That belongs to us. If the Navy's not protecting it, actioning it, using that as the attack vector from which to go after China or our adversaries, no one else is going to do it. We have got to double or triple or quadruple the number of Tysons, the cyber warfare engineers that we have. We only have about 80, 80. That's not, that's, that's a pittance compared to what we need. Um, and we've got to put uh, the Navy Cyber Warfare Development Group, Nick Wedge, where, where Tyson's working. We've got to put them to work for the Navy as their principal. Um, information Warfare Commander Authorities, Tyson was kind of touched on that. I spent uh, uh, two years as the Cryptologic Resource Coordinator on a carrier strike group working for an IWC. Um, would love to have a longer conversation about IWCs, training authorities and things like that. But everything Tyson said is absolutely uh, true. Um, we've got to fully resource the Joint Cyber Force, though, as well. The Navy's got to be all in especially our Joint Force Headquarters cyber teams, there are critical combatant commands right now with gapped billets in cyber at their JFHQ. That, that just blows my mind. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. And, and how we would allow that to happen. Um, it, we, would we allow a, a carrier strike group to get underway without uh, strike officers to perform Tomahawk missions? No, mm -hmm. we would never gap that. We are gapping cyber billets left and right all throughout the Navy. Um, follow, I think, I think some of the vision is, is out there. Let's follow it. Information Superiority 2020, Cyber uh, Superiority Vision 2022. Uh, everything the Navy is doing is about fundamentally changing the trajectory of China's sea power, though. Everything unified has to be toward that end. And finally, finally, Congress is your friend. You want authorities, you want power, you want to speed up things because we need to have decisions and acquisition and authorities made at a time and tempo of hours, days, not years. Congress is your friend. Use Congress because they want to help. Um, if the bureaucracy won't help you, Congress will. They've just sent a signal when it comes to cyber, the creation of a cyber designator and a cyber force unique to the Navy. Um, they're willing and they have the power, use them. That, that's, that would be my, my, uh, pitch there. Perfect. Thanks. All right. Tyson. Yep. Uh, I think I'll start where Jake ended. You know, we have the opportunity to revisit the means of Navy cyber. I think that's, that's a heck of an opportunity that Congress has given us. I think we need to take advantage of it. Um, I think Jake's also absolutely spot on to point out that the, the bar should not be, you know, manning and training the, the joint force, right? That's a given. We got to do that. But there is an in multiple oceans worth of Navy cyber operations to be done in defense of American interests in creating these teams, uh, making sure these teams are, you know, well-trained, capable, um, and that there's an incentive to, to stay in and do this for the Navy. Uh, is going to be massively important to our, our future success. Um, and in the end, you know, you know, I talked about the technology being the train, but the people are the capability, right? You know, we, we have 80 billets in the cyber warfare engineering community. Uh, that's not even, you know, a fifth or a tenth of what's probably needed, but not even all of those are full. Um, that means we're undergunned. We're undergunned based on what we're supposed to have on paper and, and what we need to have is sort of an objective reality. Um, you know, we have the opportunity to create a new designator. We, we're going to do that. Let's make sure that those folks are allowed to be technical cyber experts who know the domain well enough 
to be able to maneuver it, to be able to lead in it, and uh, to be able to use it to bring up bring uh, bring about operational naval warfare objectives. You know, this is something that's not impossible, right? If if we're worried about you know warships getting turned off because of cyber, then that should be an opportunity for this new generation of, of, of uh, naval cyber operators or cyber officers who are about to come about. That, that should be the goal, right? We need to be able to make sure that, you know, in a war where both sides have that capability, we do it better. We do it best. And, you know, the, the book's not written yet. You know, we're still in that 1920s era of, of naval aviation where it's not clear who's gonna have the better airplanes, the Germans, the Japanese, the Americans, the Brits. It, it, it's all about what you do in that interwar period, which we might be coming to the end of, I hope not, but but in the end, that's the opportunity. We're still there. We can still turn the ship. And, and quite frankly, you know, I know with folks like Jake, you know, the other cyber warfare engineers, a whole cadre of really smart cryptologic warfare officers who've wanted to stay in cyber, but didn't have the opportunity. We're always going to have smart young people in our Navy. Let's just leverage that and, and turn it into a warfighting capability in this domain. All right, great points. Well, gentlemen, we are out of time. I can't thank you enough. We've had Commander Jake Beber, Lieutenant Commander Tyson Medors, uh, both talking about cyber warfare. Both of their articles are published as part of the American Sea Power Project. If you go to our homepage, usni.org, and then uh, you, one of the major uh, pieces of content on our front page is the American Sea Power Project. You can find both their articles there. Gentlemen, thank you again for, uh, for writing for us, and, uh, and thanks for your time today. Thank you, Bill. Hey, thank you very much. Y'all have a great day. Happy holidays. All right. That wraps up another episode of the Proceedings Podcast brought to you by Blue Cross Blue Shield Vision Coverage. What makes good vision coverage? Things like fully covered vision care exams for all members, access to over 125,000 independent providers and national retailers. That's why you should choose Blue Cross Blue Shield Vision, FEP Vision. Plans start as low as $12 a month. See what we can do for you at bcbsfepvision.com. All right, that wraps up another episode. If you enjoy the show, like us, subscribe to the channel, tell your friends, become a member of the Naval Institute at usni.org forward slash join. Until next week, or actually I should say until January, have a happy holidays. Thanks for being part of the show. Thanks for tuning in every week. We look forward to seeing you in 2023. Remember, until then, Victory begins at the Naval Institute.